SNP front bench, no time limit. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, this budget falls on from the autumn statement when the introduction of the energy profits levy and the electricity generator levy provided an additional £75 billion of predicted income to Treasury. Now, that is money mostly arising from Scotland's energy sector. This budget, the Government has chose to increase tax duty and whisky by 10%. And even then, what does Scotland get in the budget? Well, ACORN was overlooked once again, yeah, but yeah. we are expected to be grateful for £320 million of Barnet consequentials over a two-year period. Only the Scottish Tories can think that's a fair return. So one thing's for sure, Mr <coughs> Deputy Speaker, this budget is not about the Tories trying to help grow the Scottish economy. We have actually got the highest energy bills in the UK, but we do get our fair share of the, the biggest cut in living standards since the 1950s, and we get our fair share of the Brexit cut to GDP of 4%. Yeah, so are yeah. we really supposed to be grateful for being part of the, four, uh, the broad shoulders of the UK, and when that, this is what part of the sharing process looks like? £65 billion of additional um, income from the oil and gas uh, uh, revenues. And yet the UK government won't even match the Scottish government's £500 million just transition fund, even though the Secretary of State up there was talking about the need for a just transition in the oil and gas sector. Yeah, yeah. And nothing sums up Tory port barrel politics more than the fact that three out of the five community projects in Scotland have went to the constituency of the leader of the Scottish Tories. Shameful. That plus £1.5 million for a bridge uh, to be repaired that the local Tory council thought was too low a priority for them to bother with. Now, what the Treasury does not say is that the whisky distillers in Speyside alone will be handing over more additional duty to the Treasury than the pennies that they are giving back in these communi uh, community projects. So where is the Scottish Tory leader in standing up for the whisky industry against this 10 per cent duty rise? Where is he about pointing out the fact that 75 per cent of the cost of a bottle of whisky is now taxed to the UK? Exchequer. Yeah, yeah. The fact that draft beer and wine and cider is now to be subsidised, while 99 per cent of spirits are excluded from that scheme. And let's not forget that distillers are excluded from the energy intensive support scheme, while other alcohol producers uh, receive support. So instead of trying to grow the whisky industry, it's quite clear they're treating that unfairly within the overall alcohol uh, pr uh, production sector. Yeah, yeah. And then we come to energy considerations. It really does seem that the, the, the intention is to sabotage the actual good work that has been going on in undertaking the renewable energy sector. So while the United States do have the Inflation Reduction Act, the Tories have given us the energy generator levy, but with no corresponding renewable investment allowance to encourage uh, reinvestment. We had a £20 billion announcement in funding for carbon capture and storage, but ACORN did not even get a mention once in either the budget book or the budget speech. And it is shameful, given the history of uh, previously pulling funding from Peterhead. Now, paragraph 499 in the budget document does mention Track 1 expansion later this year. So I would like to ask the ministers, is this a real, realistic prospect for ACORN? And if not, what is the timescale for announcing the Track 2 processes? Now, not only was ACORN actually the most advanced cluster and easiest to deliver, but it is required to progress to address the greenhouse gas emissions from Scotland's two biggest polluters. It is the only way that Scotland can meet its 2030 commitments, and the next time that Scottish Tories complain about Scotland possibly missing the emission targets, then they need to look in before they look out and question the decisions made down here. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the theme of storage, we've got a well-established technology in, in terms of pump storage hydro, a technology suited to complement renewable energy. It uses spare energy to pump fill reservoirs and then can generate electricity when there's a peak, peak requirement demand. The Corrie Glass has been consented since 2020. SSE have got the £1.5 billion of capital available to invest in it, and just today they've announced £100 million pounds a commitment of site investigation and advanced design works. It could be the first pumped hydro uh, storage scheme to be constructed in the UK in 40 years. It will actually double the overall capacity of pumped storage within the UK while creating 500 construction jobs in the Highlands. We be able to power 3 million homes continuously for 24 hours. The thing is, no subsidies required. They are not looking for a regulated asset-based model. They are not even looking for taxpayers to share the risk. All the industry is asking for is a cap and floor mechanism to stabilise the price received for electricity generation. 
Now, I've raised this continuously over the years. In the previous base secretary, he did let his guard down by calling it a Scottish technology. Yep. So that really does question the motives about why the UK government is not moving forward on this. But they really need to revisit that. And also on poss possibilities for pump storage hydro, Drax have submitted a plan application to more than double the capacity at Crook and Dam to take it up to one gigawatts of generation uh, capacity. So these are exactly the type of schemes that should complement intermittent renewables and take us towards construction of a stable, low-carbon, truly, truly renewable system. Now, by contrast, last year, National Grid ESO spent £4 billion pounds uh, to turn off wind turbines due to grid constraints. So we really do need a better way of managing the grid system and have a whole system approach, because right. we're just throwing money away otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Now, additionally, when we look at the budget document, for looking at a truly green uh, system, the budget document is notable for not using the phrase green hydrogen once. So is the UK government now content to fall behind other countries? What is the actual real scale of their ambition? And then, Mr Deputy Speaker, the day after the budget, we get up updated allocations for the next renewable energy auction for AR5. So despite rampant inflation, despite some pro projects struggling against the strike rates agreed for AR4, the government's decided to cut the overall budget by 30%. It's madness and that needs to be revisited urgently. Then we've got tidal stream. Scotland's genuinely leading the world. Maygen in the Pentland Firth is the largest consented tidal stream site in the world. It's generated 75% of the world's tidal stream energy to date, but has seen a 50% cost increase since securing its AR4 CFD due to external inflation factors. Now, this project can still go on and deliver against that, but only if it secures enough money going forward to be able to scale up. But instead of increasing the ring fence budget for tidal stream, the UK government's halved it, so it really does put this project and that uh, technology at risk. So again, I'm asking the government to revisit how they're doing this, because this is one opportunity to grow a technology with a UK-based supply chain and then export that knowledge and, and technology um, around the world. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, if we come to one of my hobby horses, the UK government has absolutely no problem with throwing money and promises at nuclear energy. Yeah, yeah. A £700 million stake in size will see the creation of Great British nuclear, an oxymoron if ever there was one. Mm. Now, the simple facts are there is not even a successful EPR nuclear project anywhere in the world yet. The only EPR station that is generating to, um, electricity to the grid is Taishan in China. But even that had one reactor offline for a year with damaged fuel rods, which is a possible inherent design flaw in EPR design. Olakuto 3 in Finland is 14 years late. It connected to the grid last March, but a year on, it's still only in trial operation mode. And then, if we look at the EPR in Flamino in France, that's four times over its original budget and a mere 10 years behind schedule. Now, but, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they tell us all the lessons have been learned from these projects. Um, in time for Hinkley Point C. But if we look at Hinkley Point C, it was an £18 billion estimate in 2016. It is now estimated to cost £33 billion, pounds, and guess what? It is running years late. And yet, the collective madness from the Tory front bench, encouraged by the Labour front benches, let us not worry, we will sort out the problems and we will learn the lessons for size. We will see what could go wrong. Now, even if, even if we believe size will see, will cost less in relative terms than Hinkley Point C. Given Hinkley Point C is already at thirty-three billion, we've got construction inflation, material costs increasing all the time. Without any shadow of doubt, size will see will cost upwards of thirty-five billion pounds. So how can we talk about reducing debt when they want to put a further thirty-five billion pounds of debt on our energy bills? It yeah, makes yeah. no sense. And then we'll have this insult of classing it as a green technology. Yeah. Now, if we look at the cost of the existing nuclear waste legacy, the NDA estimate is going to cost us £235 billion to clean up. There is no solution yet for dealing with radioactive waste other than burying it for thousands of years. So why do we want to class that as a green renewable uh, energy system? But, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm sure others will be touching this, we have got that one other great hope for nuclear small modular reactors. Ah. But then the reality is there's not even a regulator approved design in the UK for an SMR yet. But somehow Rolls Royce are saying they can have them operational by 2029. 
So it's the same rhetoric, the same mistakes over and over again. And the reality is, each SMR is going to cost roughly £2 billion a time, so it's hardly a cheap alternative source of, of fuel uh, energy generation. And if SMRs are so attractive, why is the taxpayer being asked to pay half the cost of a prototype and then sign up to a 35-year extortionate deal um, in terms of strike rates? It makes no sense if it was so commercially viable. So the reality is, nuclear means billions of pounds of increased debt added to our energy bills. Means future generations paying for decommissioning and handling of waste, no matter the pretense that it is somehow included in upfront estimates. It means years of further delays when that money could and should be invested in renewable energy, it should be invested in storage, it should be invested in green hydrogen, and of course it should be invested in energy efficiency upgrades. And when people talk about the job creation that comes from nuclear, well, if you're going to spend £35 billion, of course you'll create some jobs. The important thing is actually what the cost-benefit ratio is in terms of job creation, and it can be done much better with alternatives. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's clear that within the UK, Scotland's actually got a drag in its economy and a drag in our energy yeah, policy. Yeah. We might be expected to doff our caps because of that £320 million worth of Barnet consequentials we're getting over two years. That, though, I would argue, in the Chancellor's word, that is the very epitome of dependence rather than independence, and I am looking forward to working with the Chancellor to secure the latter. Yeah, yeah, yeah.